I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the uh, collision repair and refinish stage, if I can get that out today. Um, I am Scott Van Hooley with uh, the RTS team at ICAR, and uh, I'm going to be working with Scott Caboose. Hey there, Scott. We've got dual performance Scots up here, so uh, this is a uh, performance show. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about the Honda Acura laser brazed roofs, and we've got these on a few of our different models. And it's not a difficult procedure, but it's very different than things we've seen in the past from Honda. So some things we want to bring to the attention of the repairers. Yeah, I, this is a shot I love, just cutting off that laser brazed roof. Um, and this all started from actually a tech inquiry we got it uh, through Ask ICAR. And uh, I know I had questions on it, so we started talking. And we also, after that conversation, we got the answer for that that particular shot, but then we decided this would be a great video and a great presentation. Yeah, so it really started with somebody asking ICAR and send the inquiry into you and you call me and say, hey, what's going on here? Well, uh, we remember this Honda Fit issue we had a few years ago with John Eagle. We were never gonna glue a roof on a Honda. Well, now the procedure says we're gonna glue a roof on a Honda. So it's, yeah, not, not intuitive at all. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I think this is, like you said, it's so, such a departure from what we've traditionally seen, mm -hmm. and it's one of those things that so many people, I don't think, understand how much these cars have changed, and that even though it's a thin piece of sheet metal, I always kind of attribute it to, like, a structure of a house. If you're building a wall, it's all two-by-fours, it's really not that strong until you start putting the plywood on it and the drywall on it. All of a sudden, that wall becomes very stiff. And I think, you know, with the car builds, a lot of these parts are all designed to work together. And I think this is another example of that. Oh, absolutely. So in, even the, the crossbows in the roof, I mean, they're pretty thin metal. I mean, if you lean on them, they're going to bend. But when you put it all together, it creates the structure of the vehicle. And any one of those links becomes weaker than it's meant to be, then the entire assembly is weaker than it was intended. So I know we have a few different slides on this one. Uh, so it's on the Honda, the 22 Honda Civic. Yeah, so the 22 Honda Civic just released a few months ago. Uh, that is the first laser brazed roof on 22 Civic. Uh, was also on the 21 TLX uh, and now going to be on the 22. On Accord, it's been there since 18. So this has been out for a while. And I actually ran the numbers. I said, well, how many of these roof panels have we sold? So I had my uh, parts department pull that data, we sold 85 roof panels for that vehicle. So there's 85 people wandering around the show somewhere that did this before I did. So I'm not sure how they did it, but one of them actually called you and said, I want to understand this before I do it, which is probably a good idea. Yeah. And you know, that, that's one thing. I think some of these new joining techniques and things like that from the OEMs, they kind of surprise us sometimes because it doesn't look any different. Mm -hmm. And that's where, uh, you know, we've heard about laser braze, laser welded roughs for a while from a lot of OEMs, but it seems like every one of them has a different repair strategy, and it's nothing like the factory did. Yeah, so you can't do this in your body shop. You can't laser braze a roof back on. So on our service side, we have to determine how are we going to repair this vehicle in the field? Well, we have to build the procedures and come up with a way of how we're going to do that and then create the procedures in the manual of how you're going to do that. And then it's also on our Clarity, probably not a real popular car unless you're on the West Coast, you'll see more of these. Uh, Clarity comes in a plug-in hybrid, comes in a full electric, and it comes in a hydrogen fuel cell version. Um, kind of a test vehicle for us, trying to figure out what that space looks like. And we're learning a lot from that car, but you're probably not going to see a lot of those. They are on the road, they're out there, and, but it does have a laser braze roof, and that was actually our first one. So in 17, we came out with that. Okay. Well, and I, I always have to just make a comment on the hydrogen fuel cell is still a high-voltage vehicle as well. Absolutely. It's a full electric system just powered by hydrogen. Uh, and I think that's one thing that a lot of people overlook, so I always like to point that out when we talk about it. That, that is very good. So these have batteries underneath the chassis of the vehicle. There's specific procedures how to test those battery systems after a collision. 
Uh, we could talk a whole nother repairs realm on that one. <laughs> so we started talking about this. I know this is one thing that, um, you know, we talked about it where when you're cutting that roof off, there's a lot of structure underneath that you have to be watching for. And this diagram that's right out of the repair procedure shows that really well. Yeah, so it's nice that we have this cutaway view because as you can see, the aperture is on an angle, almost a 45 degree. So if you just cut down through that laser braze and say, well, I'm just gonna cut this braze out, you're gonna cut through the aperture of the car. And if you go too deep, you'll actually get into the D-ring of the car, which is 1500. And now you've got a big mess. Yeah. So that simple rough repair for something, tree branch fell on it, now becomes cutting the whole unicide off and a very intrusive repair. Yeah, could even turn a repairable car into a total loss. Um, and I know, the, so the, the unicide here, which is that outer panel, you talked about that. Um, I've just broke the importance of protecting that so you don't damage that as well. Yeah, so we use tape on there and we started out just using like a green masking tape. I would highly suggest getting some duct tape on there because if you touch the green masking tape, you're through it. We did. Uh, we, we, we scratched it in a couple of places. We we're gonna paint it anyway, so I don't know if that's detrimental. But I think the better you protect it, the less repair you're gonna have to do after the fact because of damage that you build into the car. But to me, the biggest thing is get that blade on an angle, stay away from that aperture, and then you're gonna have to grind it back when you're finished. Okay. So we got a video here that uh, we're gonna kind of talk through. If uh, I can, can you play on that for us? All right. This is a 2019 Accord. We had stripped it out the day before, so we got everything out of the way that we needed to. Yeah, and it, you know, that's one of the things I think that is really great in this video is just showing that there are a lot of things that need to be R and I'd. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, we spent most of a day just disassembling the car before we got into anything structural. Yeah. So here we're just peeling back some of the urethane from the window, cleaning that off so we can get at the spot welds. Yeah, and uh, the tool that's coming up here, once you get that urethane off, the file belt sanders, I absolutely love those. I absolutely. Wish, when I was in the shop, I really wish we had those. Yeah, so I kept looking at them when they first came out, and I'm like, oh, it's kind of a neat tool. I don't know if I'd really use it or not. And then I got one, and that's like my right arm now. I, I love that thing. I've got like six of them. Oh, my wife's here. I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> So here we're just cleaning the surface. We're getting all the paint off of there. We're identifying where the spot welds are. And the idea here is to find out exactly the center of those spot welds so we can grind or, or drill and not affect the base metal underneath. So we're being really cautious here to grind just that top material, not get into the bottom level. Um, I've seen where a lot of people get too aggressive with this tool and end up with divots in the base metal and then you may be replacing more panels. Well, and the one, the clue I always have seen with them is that if it just starts to turn blue, stop. Yes, yep. And if you stop there, you're usually gonna be pretty good. If you keep going until that blue goes away, you're now down into that base material for the next panel. Yeah, so here I'm using a seam buster and I would grind them until I could just almost see the circle going around the weld and then I'd break the rest of it with the seam buster and that's seemed to work pretty good. A lot of times I'll put a wedge in there or something so when I get through it pops. Yep. So just put a little pressure on the panel and that works pretty good too. Yeah, so, you know, going through and doing all this now, that, that front uh, roof bow, that's a pretty high MPA on this vehicle as well, is it not? Yeah, I'd have to look it up to tell you exactly, right. but yeah, it's a, it's a high strength steel for sure. Yep. Uh, not sure if it was ultra high strength or not, I'd have to look it up. Yeah, because I know that every once in a while they, they sneak like a 1500 MPA part yeah. in there that you have to really watch for to make sure that you're no, not doing any harm to that because that's going to be rather difficult to replace. Yeah, and you're not allowed to repair it. So if you grind too deep, you can't just weld it up because anytime you weld on ultra high strength steel, you reduce the strength of the steel. So you took away the crash protection that was built into the car. So now we're, we're taking a tool here, we're taping off the sides and we're actually marking a distance from the gutter that in the service manual it said, I three or five millimeters, I wouldn't be afraid to go a little bit farther just to stay a little bit farther away from that aperture next time. It does create a little more work grinding it back, but it's a lot better than having to weld up an aperture. 
So, well, now on this one particular one, it's a sunroof. Is the removal much different if it doesn't have the sunroof? No, it's actually a very similar procedure. The biggest difference we'll get into talking about the brackets in that there's two more brackets on a roof that doesn't have a sunroof than there is on the sunroof one. Um, the sunroof has some additional bolts that hold that part of the assembly. The, the bracketry behind the sunroof comes with the roof panel and then part of it bolts in, uh, which actually works out pretty nice for locating the panel. It's kind of hard to not get it in the right spot. Okay. So, and I know you guys use uh, the, the you're using the cutoff wheels here. Um, what about like the ripper bits on the, the air chisel? Yeah, I don't see why that wouldn't work as long as you can control your depth. Um, definitely another tool that you could use there. Yeah, because I, I mean, I like the cutoff wheels, but every once in a while they catch a little bit and they you can slip real easy. So yeah. I always like to kind of do my rough cutting with that that ripper bit on the air chisel and that seemed to help. Yep, and that was one thing we talked about when we were doing this is it might be good just to totally rough cut this thing with maybe a panel ripper or something like that and leave a few inches there so that you can actually see behind and understand, especially the first time you do it, it it's nice to have the picture and service information, but it's really good to see what's underneath there. Yeah, because sometimes that, that profile, it looks like, oh, I got room there, but it's actually a little deceiving because it's not exactly the scale. Yeah, and, and the angle. Yeah. The, the angle is what really threw us off is to understand how far that panel came underneath of there. Yeah. Well, and any time you you're have that much metal to cut through, you know, protecting the rest of the vehicle with the spark paper and covering things up, getting it out of harm's way, uh, there's quite a bit of welding blankets on that picture there. Yeah, I think we use most of them. <laughs> <laughs> and we could have probably used another one here or there. And this was really a surgical procedure, trying to do this without going too deep and to keep that angle so we didn't get into that aperture. And I, I'm sure somebody that's put one on has been a little more reckless than we have and done quite a bit of damage underneath there. Uh, it's always uh, interesting when you're getting recorded and you have to be very precise and <laughs> set up the shot and have it look really nice. Yeah. Because uh, video can make it look really quick and easy for people, but it does take some skill. Yeah, well, we spent a day and a half doing this job. So the first day, we, we basically did everything on the car. We got the roof off, got the new panel prepped and ready to go on. And the next day during the morning, we assembled it and installed it. Um, now, you could go a lot faster, especially your second one, and we were worried about the video and stuff like that. But still, we spent a lot of time doing this one procedure. Yeah, we always refer to that as the, the video magic where the parts just magically come off so nice and easy and quick. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you're going through here, and, you know, there's a lot of foam on that, that roof that you're going to have to cut through. Yeah. Yeah, so there's adhesive at the back or front corners. There's adhesive at the back corners. And then there's uh, NVH foam across all the crossbars. And we'll see that in a little bit. Now, here you're seeing some of the bolts that hold in that sunroof assembly. So we're taking those out, I don't know, four or six bolts in there. Now we're going to cut that NVH foam. And here we're using a wire, so a piano wire or guitar wire, whatever you got, uh, will work very well. Uh, I like to cut it as close to the panel as I can and leave as much of that NVH there and just reattach it. And here I've got a molding cutter that uh, worked really good in the areas where you couldn't get it both sides with a wire. So we had to find a different way to get in there and cut that. And we really didn't want to have to heat it up or do anything like that. Well, yeah, and that's a good point, too, because a lot of times panels, we do have to heat it up mm -hmm. in order to pull off a quarter panel or things like that with the NVH foam. Um, but like you said earlier, the roof bows are sometimes, when they're individual, they're kind of flimsy, so they you can are. do some damage. Absolutely. Yeah, if you tried to pull this off with the NVH foam still attached, you would probably do some damage to the crossbows. Not the front one and the rear, they're kind of heavy, but the one in the middle is pretty lightweight. Yeah, and, and again, that's one of those things that if you're going to do damage while you're doing the repair, you're kind of hindering yourself and making a lot more work and, you know, maybe even potentially totally an older car because you're careless and in a hurry. Yeah. So, so here we've got the main roof panel out of the way. Now, there's still quite a bit of material on those edges, maybe a half inch or so in some spots that we're going to have to go back in and grind that off. We'll, we'll, you'll see the braze. It's gold in color. And it's going to show you exactly where that is. So when we get to this one, you know, we mentioned that door ring. Um, 
the, diff the Civic has the, the 1500 MPA. Some of the other ones have different ones, but that's where, you know, referring to that service information is really critical. Yeah, so here we're looking at the, uh, the build data. So we're, we're looking at how did Honda assemble this vehicle, what materials did they use, what thickness was it. Then we give you some really nice cutaway views that show you, okay, how far away is that outer from that inner? And in this view, we're looking at where is the 1500 MPA in this car, which is the strongest steel we use. And it's just warning you, hey, we've got 1500 in these areas. Be cautious when you're working in those areas so you don't do damage to something that didn't have it before. And I just realized I skipped over that second video. So let's <laughs> go back to that. Can you hit play on that one for me? I love technology. Yeah, it, <laughs> and at SEMA, it likes to jump around and all of a sudden magically stop working. There we go. There we go. So now we're trimming back that area. And once we got down to the actual weld, we started using some duckbill pliers just to break it loose because we didn't want to go too deep with the cutoff wheel. Uh, we were really trying to be really careful around that uh, aperture not to damage it. We spent quite a bit of time doing this, to be honest. I mean, in the video, it looks like it's a couple of minutes, but we spent a good amount of time just making sure we got that out of there safely and without damaging anything else on the car. So now, if you'd left that flange a little bit lo longer, it probably would have been a little easier to work it back and forth, or? Yeah, probably, if we left a couple inches on there. It might have been able to get a little more leverage. Okay. Yeah, because that, that was one thing going through the video that I kind of saw, like, yeah, it would be nice to have that short so you don't have as much, but to have something to hold on to to really work, it would be helpful. Yeah. It was definitely nice to have a helper, too. <laughs> yeah, free labor is always good. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and well, and you know, you can really see where that that laser, the laser braze is there, and, and getting that cleaned out. You know, that's such a fine line. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of people the first time they do this that are going to struggle a little bit just finding it and marking it. So, working it back and forth like you did, I think, is real helpful. Yeah, that that braze is probably an eighth of an inch wide, if that. So it, it doesn't stand out at all. And when the car is finished, it flows right into the body. You'd think it was made out of one piece. And that's really what the design engineers were looking for. They wanted to make the car look a little sleeker, get rid of those gutter moldings, uh, just make the car flow, but then also still have some control over rainwater. So if you notice in the video or the slide before, the roof is set slightly lower than the apertures, and that's so that the rainwater goes there and it works like a gutter. To, so you open the door, you don't get wet. Well, anyway, that, that was always one thing that, you know, when that ditch molding was there, you had to make sure you had it, you know, welded down correctly and sealed correctly because that's a water leak potential and yeah. all that kind of stuff where this kind of helps eliminate some of that. Yeah, I would think this would be a less uh, leak-prone repair just because you've got the adhesive in that whole seam. And definitely wear gloves when you're doing this because you're going to be around a lot of sharp metal. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, no one's ever cut themselves on a little sh sharp piece of metal, have they? Yeah, I, I may know one guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I see we got the file belt sander out there again and, and just got Yeah, so once we broke it, it off, there was still just little pieces in there, and the new roof is actually going to sit pretty flush in there. So you can't have anything sticking out. It'll hold the roof up too high. So you need to make sure you clean all of that out of there and get right down to the aperture. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of times that body shop technicians will, will think, oh, this is, the engineer just hates me. They designed something this way. But, I mean, there's so many little nuances that we don't know about as a collision repair technician that, you know, something like this, it's it, the strength of it. And like you said, adhesive all the way along. And, you know, it's one of those things that there's a reason behind it, and we just have to understand it so that we can take care of it properly. I'll guarantee the engineers do not hate you because they don't think of you enough to hate you. 
I, I'd love to say they're in there thinking about the body guys fixing these cars, but that's really one of the last things they do. Well, you know, and I think, you know, it's a big thing with, okay, we have to make it super strong to meet all the crash test requirements, and we have to make it get 60 miles per gallon and still be fast and fun to drive. And that's, that's what's driving all this stuff is CAFE standards, and it's a requirement. Yeah. And the two of them are in opposition. And then we want to add so much more technology to the car. So you think about, okay, 10 years ago, we didn't have radars, we didn't have cameras, we didn't have hybrid system, all this stuff that's added to that car and added weight. If we'd have left the shell of the car alone, we'd have 4,500 pound Civics. Well, that's never going to get to anywhere near that mileage that we're looking at. So we've had to find new and creative ways to lightweight these vehicles. So now we're just cleaning off our weld nuggets and trimming up the edges, getting ready. You can see just a little bit of that gold-colored laser braze on there. We're trying to trim that up. And that's one thing with the, the brazing. When you start to see sparks, you're getting, you're getting through it, and that's yeah. a nice telltale sign so you don't get a little too aggressive. Yeah, but it's so thin that you're hitting the edges too, so. Yeah. All right. So moving on to the next one. So the, we talked a little bit about the 1500 MPA door ring. But now you have metal, manual settings for that spot weld. It, yeah, so if this is on the Civic. The Civic has the 1500 D-ring on it there. So in here, we've got manual weld settings uh, for the brackets. We haven't even talked about the brackets. So the roof comes laser brazed. You're going to put it on by a combination of mechanical fasteners using brackets and bolts and adhesive. So now we've got to locate those brackets, determine where they go. We're going to dry fit the roof. And then once we've located them, we've got to attach them. And we found that there were multiple different attachment methods. So on this model Civic, in the back, we've got a four plate spot weld. That's going on to mild steel. Auto set is just fine on your welder for those. On the next two going forward, the one right in front of the B pillar and the one in front of that, we're calling out a weld condition number 31. Well, that's a manual weld condition, and those are going to be on any welds on a Honda that have ultra high strength steel in that stack. So somewhere in that stack, there is 1500 MPA or 980 or 1180, and we're going to call it a manual weld setting. And not only do you have to set up your welder manually, but you also have to use the correct tips. Because when we tested those manual set weldings, we used an R16 tip. Well, if you set that to our required settings and use an F cap, that's a big wide flat cap, you have way too much surface area, and you're probably going to blow some holes. So, and, you know, I think this is one of the, the critical steps because a lot of times body guys will go in there and they're going to say, I'm going to get that roof off, and I'll look at the procedure on how to put it in later. Yeah. Now, that would be a big mistake. And honestly, the best way for this one to happen is for your repair planner to have read the procedure before they wrote the estimate because you don't want to get a roof panel without the brackets and the bolts because you can't install it properly. And you may have that car sitting there for a while waiting for parts. Well, and, and I even like on uh, this other one here where they're actually calling out for plug welds on that one. Yeah, so that's actually a five layer stack and we don't have any weld conditions for five layer stacks to do a spot weld. So they put a plug weld there. And then our plug welds depends on the thickness of the material you're welding. So these little brackets are really thin. I think they were 0.6 of a millimeter. Um, so that's going to be a six millimeter plug weld. Anything one millimeter, 1.6 is going to use an eight millimeter plug weld. Anything 1.6 or bigger is going to use a 10 millimeter plug weld. So you've got to kind of know some of the background information in our service information to know, yeah, it's a plug weld, but which plug weld? Well, and if you're dealing with the 1500 MPA or, and, and things like that, where they tell you you can do that plug weld, um, you just have to use that different wire as well. Yeah, so anytime you're attaching something 590 MPA to something else that's 590 or higher, you need to use the X96 wire. So there's a lot of considerations in the background just in those little brackets welding them on. And, and that's one of the things that, you know, the procedure is, is so critical because if you think, okay, the brackets, I can just weld them, they're all the same, they're a little bracket, you're not going to do it right, and you've got to have to make sure that you've documented what you've done as well. Yeah, exactly. So if you weld those all the same, you did it wrong. There's four different welds there that are very unique and discoverable, and if there was ever an issue, 
somebody will figure out what you did and see if it led to any damages. So now we're going to start the video for the installation here. So notice the back side of the roof, we had epoxy primered that and then painted the edges to kind of match what it was. That, that's something that Honda has been requiring for a long time now. So we did it before we installed it just because it's a little easier to do that. And we knew by gluing it and spot welding the edges, we wouldn't be burning that off when we did the repair. So now on the front there, you have it already prepped for the spot welds Yep. on the front edge. So you had to locate those because some of the panels are scalloped. And if you don't have that spot weld in the exact same spot, there's nothing to attach it to. So I know some manufacturers tell you, you know, stagger your spot welds or different things like that. In this case, that's not an option. We're going to put these spot welds right almost exactly where they were when we took the roof apart. And so now you're, you're going through and in installing the brackets, the bolts in. Yeah, so, so this has actually got the adhesive in here in this video. So you can see those welds on this bracket. We located those brackets with a uh, paint marker. We dry fit it beforehand. And now we're going to torque every one of those bolts. And that's, again, the repair procedure details what you need to do for the torque specs. Yeah, it gave us all the torque specs right in there. And I would think, you know, if you're going to run these in with a even a quarter drive battery operated gun, you're probably going to strip them out. They're pretty lightweight, and the torque spec, I think, was 7.9 newton meters or something like that. So it's not much. I do love that torque wrench. <laughs> One of my favorite tools. So, so when you're, you're prepping for the spot welding, do you have to do anything on the other side of that flange? So on the mating flanges that don't have adhesive, on a spot weld, we require zinc-rich weld-through primer. Okay. So the corners of the roof had adhesive, like the four inches on each end, but then in the middle, it was weld-through primer in the mating surfaces. Okay. So now, when you put the adhesive on there, would you recommend putting some tape on both sides? Just Absolutely. <laughs> we missed the roof side, and it took a little cleanup. <laughs> but yeah, we, we spent a little bit of time cleaning up that we probably didn't have to. If we'd have put some fine line tape there and peeled it when we were done, it would have saved us some time. Because yeah. just like at the, home, at, at the house, it's easier to clean all that up. If you have that tape, you can peel off and Absolutely. That, tool that uh, seam. So on both ends here, these were just auto set spot welds here. So I left the R16 caps on. You can see that cap's got a big radius to it. And just the very center that's actually touching. Now the machine in auto set mode already knows what tips are on there and compensates the settings for it. But what our engineers told us is on ultra high strength steel, these machines don't understand it. So we tried auto set on all these welders and said, you know what? On 1500 MPA, it just doesn't work as well as we want it to. So that's why we create manual settings for all those welds. Some of the newer spot welders actually have the OEM settings built into it. So you can go to an OEM setting, you can go to a Honda menu and put in weld condition 31 and it'll make that weld for you. It's already got our parameters set in there, which is kind of neat. All right, and what are we doing here? So here I'm just protecting that flange and what, I, what I'm trying to make sure is that I'm letting my painter know, don't paint here. So the glass is part of the structure of the car. And if we paint that surface, the paint doesn't have as much adhesion as what we're looking for out of the urethane and the glass. So I'm just putting that tape on there to remind the painter, hey, don't paint here, e-coat or epoxy only. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that, you know, from factory, that, that finish is a lot different than what we can do in the aftermarket. And it's a little scary that people still don't understand that, that important point. Yeah, at, at the factory, I mean, we can bake these things at 390 degrees, and there's so many things we can do on that level that you just can't do in the aftermarket. So that's one of the standard operating procedures that should be in your shop, just showing you make sure that you don't do this. It's only eco and epoxy are as strong as that adhesive that's going in your window. All right, and so now this was something that you had pointed out to me is just the recommended sealers and adhesives. So we have a crossover list. So in the body repair manual, it's going to call out a specific product. So in this case, it called out 3M7333 impact resistant structural adhesive. Then we also have a crossover document. So if your shop uses SEM or 
any of the other products that are Lord Fuser. Uh, we have a crossover that says, okay, if we call 7333, here's the other ones that we found that are equivalent to that. So if your shop uses one of those brands, you don't have to go out special and buy just the 3M. Okay. And actually on the roof, we'd used Lord Fuser on one side and 3M on the other, just to see if there was any major differences. Uh, I would never do that in the field because it can cause some other problems that we ran into. But uh, it was, neither one seemed to make much difference to this point. In, in the actual repair, crash testing would hopefully show the same thing. Yeah, and that's another important point is that it's not the traditional panel bonder that we have used. We're using that crash tough, toughened adhesive that we started seeing on like aluminum strut towers and things like that. But now that's really starting to spread to a lot of different areas on the car. Yeah, the manufacturers really like that in the repair process because it acts a lot more like the adhesives that we use at the factory. Uh, in the next impact, it stays a little flexible and doesn't crack near as quick as the materials that we had used in the past. Some of our old manuals still call out 8115. Um, I would stick with whatever's in that manual. Okay, so we touched on the torque specs, just calling out that that's really important that we actually have to torque all that down. Uh, corrosion protection, this was another thing we touched on uh, when we were talking about this. Yeah, so the inside of the roof, we had epoxy primered that and then painted the edges to match. It works really good if you do it like this. This was actually one that I did in Japan. And we put the quarter panel in the box that it came in, put it in the booth, scuffed it, epoxied it, and then we cut in the edges to look like the one that we cut off. It adds a little bit of time to the procedure, but when you're done, it really makes it almost an invisible repair. And some of these areas you just can't get to once it's installed. So, like we mentioned earlier, we did do um, what we're calling repairs realm, where we go through this procedure. Um, there's a lot of conversations around it, similar to this, um, but uh, we wanna be doing a lot more of these kinds of uh, procedure kind of videos to help the industry you know, call attention to something that's a unique repair situation like this laser brazed roof. So thank you for taking the time to work with us on this. No, it was a great project that uh, we collaborated on and I, I think it turned out really well. I'm really hoping that uh, Honda sees the value in this and we can continue doing that. Uh, we've This same car has damaged rear frame rails and if you've ever done rear frame rails on an 18 up Accord, it is the absolute most invasive procedure I've ever read on a Honda. And so I'd love to do a video on that maybe next year and uh, just show people what's involved in that and get ahead of the curve so that they understand, hey, if I see this, this is what I'm in for. So this was kind of a, a really a, a, a perfect storm because the, the shop that contacted us, so we got in contact with Honda, got them the information they needed, led us to the Repair Realm video that then trickled down to uh, an inquiry into DEG. Yeah, so another shop got one in that needed a roof, and they started looking at the time in CCC. And they said, okay, a 17 Accord, which has a standard, just well done roof, like you've done 100 times, paid 20 and a half hours. And then they looked at the 18 Up Accord, and it paid 19 and a half hours. Like, how can this roof pay an hour less? Well, it's because nobody did a real time study on it. So we went to CCC, or to the DEG, uh, got a hold of Danny over there, and we gave Danny probably more information than he's ever had on an inquiry, right? Yeah. We gave him an hour-long video. We gave him all the OEM repair procedures. We gave him written stuff from Honda. And he sent that into CCC and said, hey, the time on here doesn't seem adequate based on what has to be done. Within three days, CCC got back to us and added six and a half hours to that job. So now the next person that puts that roof on is going to get six and a half hours more than the person that did it before we did this video. So if nothing else came out of this, that's a win for the industry. And, and that's that's one of the things that we like to really promote is we want to help, but if you don't send in the inquiry and don't let us know about it, we can't help the industry. Um, so there's a lot of times where people ask a question to us and the information's already in the repair procedure. They just don't know where to locate it, but ones like this, we can make a, a really good difference and help the industry get a more accurate repair plan, and uh, even the correct parts. Yeah, so you and I have worked together for a long time now, and it works really nice. So the shops will get a hold of iCar through the Ask iCar. 
Uh, they'll elevate it up to Scott if they need to. When it gets to him, if he can't figure it out using our service information, he'll call me. And he says, hey, Scott, what does Honda think about this? Most of the time I can figure it out and tell you exactly what we need to have done. But then there's also times where this is something new to me. I haven't seen it, and the service information really doesn't address it well enough to make a decision. That's when I actually go to the guys in Japan. So our body repair manuals are written in Japan. There's a team of 19 people there that do that. And then they're translated into 26 different languages. And when we get it, we review it. Hopefully it's 100%, but every now and then we find gaps and holes. And from there, we'll go back to the guys that wrote it and say, hey, we need more information here, clarify something. Usually within 24 to 48 hours, they can get back with me, and then we'll get it to the consumer, and then we'll update the information. So Ask iCar causes a chain reaction that helps the entire industry. So, and thank you for everybody listening. Is there any questions from the audience? Don't be shy. We're here all day. <laughs> oh. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day.